Hello and welcome to Calcium Channel Blockers. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Before we start talking about calcium channel blockers, let's talk a little bit about calcium itself and what it does in the body. Think about the letter C. Calcium causes contraction. Calcium causes contraction. That is the main point we want to keep in mind here as we continue our talk about calcium. Calcium is found primarily in the bone, but there's an important interaction between calcium and phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium. Interestingly, all of our electrolytes are connected in one way or another, so when they start moving in different directions, we often end up with more than one electrolyte abnormality. Now, maybe you've seen this in practice where you end up with more than one electrolyte abnormality at the same time. Calcium influx into the muscle cells is necessary for contraction to occur. So calcium causes contraction. We have to have that calcium moving into those muscle cells in order to have contraction occur. Blocking our calcium influx then. Now we're not blocking all of it, not every little bit, but we're blocking some calcium. So because we're blocking some, the force and the velocity of contraction will be decreased. There's another component to keep in mind about calcium. We have two different types of calcium. We have calcium that is bound to albumin. The vast majority of our circulating calcium in the blood is this type of calcium. It's bound to albumin. The other type is called free or ionized calcium. The free ionized calcium is the electrolyte. That's the part that's actually doing all the work. However, we can unbind some of that calcium from albumin if necessary to increase our calcium level in the blood. So let's take a look at what happens with calcium and the heart. Again, calcium causes contraction of the heart muscle, so that's going to increase contractility. So we need to have an adequate amount of calcium that is getting to the heart in order to maintain contractility. We also need to have enough calcium available so the arterioles can contract, which is going to maintain our blood pressure. We'll be measuring how much contraction we have are the arterioles by our afterload. The diagram to the right is trying to illustrate what happens with these calcium ion channels. So we have the picture that's kind of at the bottom showing the inside and the outside of the cell, the messenger, the receptor, etc. But if you look at the top pictures, you'll see that there is one that shows it being open and one showing it being closed. So if we open up that ion channel, we allow calcium to come in. If we block that ion channel, then calcium cannot come into the cell to cause contraction. Now calcium is maintained in the bloodstream by a number of different mechanisms. Let's start in the bottom right and work our way around this diagram. So what it's saying is that our blood level of calcium is decreasing. That's going to stimulate the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland will produce parathyroid parathormone, which is going to stimulate calcium release from the intestine, so get uh, the intestine to absorb more calcium from our diet, and to cause release from the bone. Remember that most of our calcium is being stored in the bone. As our calcium level rises, the thyroid gland is going to be stimulated to release calcitonin, which is then going to tell the bone to reabsorb calcium so that calcium will go back into the bone and we won't have a high calcium level in the bloodstream. So there's this constant balance between these two components that's maintaining our calcium level in the body. Well, if this is all going on, then how come we could ever have a problem with calcium? Well, either we don't have enough calcium in the bone to be able to give up 
to provide more calcium to the bloodstream, or the patient's not getting it in their diet or both, or we're having a faulty release of calcium, so our parathyroid is not sensing that we have a low level and then stimulating the release of calcium. Calcium channel blockers are going to block that calcium influx. So in that previous picture, we showed that uh, there were these channels that calcium was going through, and calcium channel blocker is going to close off that channel so that calcium cannot make it from outside to inside the cell. Now this is going to have a couple different effects on our patient. One is it's going to decrease our cardiac output by decreasing contractility and decreasing heart rate. It's going to slow the heart down and it's going to decrease our contractility. So cardiac output will go down. Also, it'll decrease our afterload by causing vasodilation. So remember the other piece with this was calcium was causing contraction of the arterioles, which was increasing the blood pressure. Well, if we cause this blockage of calcium so that it's not getting into those arterioles, then we're going to have vasodilation and that's going to decrease blood pressure. So oftentimes calcium channel blockers are used in our patients to try to decrease blood pressure. In a cardiac patient, we may use a calcium channel blocker to try to decrease the heart rate and decrease contractility. Now that may sound like it's kind of silly. Why would we do that in a patient who has heart problems? Well, the reason is because if we do those things, we decrease oxygen consumption by the heart. Therefore, hopefully oxygen delivery will meet the oxygen consumption. At the same time, we're also decreasing afterload, making it easier for the heart to pump. As you may expect, some side effects include dysrhythmias, okay, if we're blocking calcium to be able to get to the heart muscle and to be able to get to the the electrical system of the heart, we may not be able to have a normal rhythm, so we could get some dysrhythmias, we're slowing the heart down, etc. Edema can form, we can get a headache from the vasodilation, fatigue as we drop the blood pressure and drowsiness, flushing, all of those things from dropping the blood pressure and causing that vasodilation. We want to use precautions though with heart failure. Edema may worsen in heart failure, including pulmonary edema. It may contribute to hypotension, especially if we are using calcium channel blockers in combination with other antihypertensives. Renal disease, because calcium channel blockers are excreted by the kidney, and liver disease, we want to use caution because these drugs are metabolized by the liver. So some nursing considerations assess the blood pressure, obviously, the pulse, Okay, because we're going to slow the heart down a little bit here. Our respiratory rate, our EKG intervals, including the PR interval, the QRS, and the QT interval. Evaluate for a decrease in chest pain, a decrease in blood pressure, if that's what our goal is, and dysrhythmias. And teach the patient and family how to take a pulse so they can see if the pulse is decreasing. Or maybe they're using at home one of those... Uh, automated blood pressure cuffs so they can get a blood pressure and a pulse on the patient. Avoid hazardous activities due to dizziness, especially in the first few times the patient is taking the medication. After the patient is stable on the medication, uh, then the patient should be able to uh, manage without having dizziness. The need for compliance very important that the patient remains compliant in all of the areas of their medical regime, including diet, exercise, and stress reduction as well, so that hopefully we're having the very best outcome for a patient who's taking a calcium channel blocker. Well, thank you for joining me for calcium channel blockers. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now. <music>